I'm Yoram Chazoni, and this is Natcon Talk, where nationalism and conservatism meet. Today I'll be speaking with Joshua Mitchell. He's a professor of political theory at Georgetown University and the author of a great new book, American Awakening. Joshua Mitchell, welcome to Natcon Talk. Glad to be here, Yoram. Thank you for having me. Well, it's wonderful to have you, Josh. I, I think given what's going on in the United States right now, uh, we can use your skills both as a political theorist and as political commentator and as a theologian. We're going to need your help to interpret what's happening. Uh, to me, it looks like we're going into to the second consecutive election in the United States in, in which a very significant part of the public believes that the election was stolen or might for some other reason uh, not be legitimate. And without you know taking sides one side or, or another, I, I don't have any particular expertise on the questions of uh, of uh, voter fraud, how much of it there was or whether there was. But uh, I, I think that I, I can tell a country that is uh, coming unglued, where uh, neither side trusts the other enough to be able to conduct uh, the kinds of semi-reasonable election campaigns followed by semi-reasonable transitions that we were used to for decades. Yeah. Can yeah. you help us out? How do you see this? Well, same way. Uh, the figure that's being tossed about is that 70 million people don't trust the outcome of the election. Having been in Chicago for a number of years, I know how machine politics works. Uh, Chicago politics is notorious for producing voters who are on, on the death rolls. And there's all sorts of concerns about what happened in Philadelphia, what happened in Atlanta, what happened in Detroit, what happened in Milwaukee. Uh, were these cities delivered for the Democratic Party? Uh, late at night, after most people had gone to bed, suddenly the the Biden tabulations jumped uh, strongly. And statistically, people have argued that it's almost impossible that the number of votes that came in uh, could have all gone to Biden. And that's what it looks like. Um, I think equally troubling is the fact that um, the press has called that Biden is the president-elect. That is not how this works in America. Uh, the press can project a winner, but the press does not call a winner. And yet here, uh, in the final insult to Donald Trump, they have once again overstepped their bounds and declared that Joe Biden is the president. That is not going to work itself out until after the election is certified. Uh, you might recall in the election of 2000, it took 85 days for Bush to be certified, and, and both parties were prepared to sit back and wait for the result, although tempers surely flared. But in this case, uh, you know, they are going to purge Donald Trump. Uh, and, and that's the tragedy of this. It's not just that they're purging Donald Trump. They are once again saying to 70 to 100 million people, you don't count. And that's not going to be forgotten. Uh, Josh, you, you were one of the first intellectuals, I think. Uh, you, you're a professor at Georgetown, uh, a, a, a decorated academic with a number of books under your belt. And we'll, we'll, we'll be talking about some of them a little bit later. But uh, back in tw 2016, during the summer, uh, during the election, I remember very clearly uh, reading reading your uh, your essays about uh, the the uh, uh, the nationalist or populist upsurge in America and other countries. You were, you were one of the very first who uh, came out as a political theorist, explaining what was happening and trying to understand where the Republican Party, where conservatism needed to go uh, in light of the things that were being uh, learned at the time. So that that's, you know, f four years and a few months ago. Uh, can you walk us through what was it that moved you to uh, speak out uh, in, in, in favor of or understanding and interpreting nationalism or populism? W what brought you to that? And, uh, and then, I'll, then I'll ask you how you think it turned out. So my view is that Eight, 1989 to 2016 was a particular historical moment. And, and my view is that moment is actually over, though I think um, there are the forces that, that were empowered by that moment are not prepared to yet give it up. And that moment, I thought, was characterized by uh, a split in sovereignty that normally one thinks of nations as being sovereign. And after 1989, when the Cold War was won, 
you had all sorts of dreamy ideas, both the neoliberals on the left and, and frankly, the neoconservatives on the right, uh, dream of, of, of something bigger than the nation, some kind of global project. And, and paradoxically, what you also saw coterminous with this was the, the collapse of sovereignty into the self. Identity politics is, is a claim about sovereignty. And so my argument is that it was and continues to be that 1989 to 2016 was this bold experiment in which sovereignty moved away from the national level, moved up to global level, and moved down to the selfie self. And I think there are many people who are still involved in that project, but, uh, but that's actually not a viable human project that in the final analysis, we have to build a world with those around us within a national border. That is the highest community that we can have. What Tocqueville saw was, was just extraordinary. In the later, later passages of Democracy in America, he says, I can foresee a time coming when men will think of themselves as greater than kings and less than men. The and is important. He's observing that as we move more and more into this democratic delink condition, the self collapses in upon itself and that has two consequences. On the one hand, the self becomes absolutely sovereign uh, because we cut our relations with others. And on the other hand, precisely because it's this lonely, isolated individual self, it feels itself to be utterly impotent. So in its in its identity politics manifestation, it feels itself to be greater than king. So the condition under which you and I are going to negotiate is that you have to accept my identity, a word I'm deeply skeptical about. Um, so you oscillate back and forth between thinking that you're the most important thing in the world, hence everybody taking selfies of themselves as if the world is a backdrop for themselves on the one hand. And then on the other hand, feeling like nobody can do anything unless we have, say, the Paris Accord. So the planet will die unless we have complete global coordination and probably crony capitalism that goes with it. I could see this happening uh, in my studies in the early 2000s. And then when Donald Trump come, came along, I said, well, of course, he's the person who's saying this is not a viable alternative. And, uh, and I, he's actually right. The question of, I'm not sure he'll, uh, I don't think his appeals will work. But, but nevertheless, I think the left now thinks, and perhaps the neoconservatives too, that we can go back to business as usual. My claim is we can't go back to business as usual. We've, we, the moment has changed, and now the question still is, how can we establish our nations and national sovereignty? Well, I, I remember your, again, going back to those uh, surprising essays of yours in the summer and fall of 2016, one of your central planks was that uh, was just this already then you were saying that uh, that conservatives had had not handled the issue of uh, race but particularly you were talking about black Americans not not just race in general yes. but you made the argument I I think I think you might be the first the the first conservative who I, I heard making this argument that uh, that that the black experience in America is not like the experience of other races. There are many, many other groups, but none of them went through in America what uh, what the black community did under slavery and, and for a century after that. Can, yeah. can you help us so, un understand how, how do you think that uh, that a proper view of, uh, of of what of what the black community went through? How does it look? How is how is it different from color blindness? which is yeah. what most, most conservatives have believed in for a long time. My point uh, in those early essays was that, uh, well, a number of things. First, the, the left has made the argument that as civil rights goes, so goes women's rights, gay rights, and transgender rights. And, and my argument is no, uh, actually that's not true. And if you talk to most blacks in America, they get very irked by that claim. Uh, I wrote an essay for First Things uh, claiming that black Americans are the only ones that rightfully wear the crown of thorns, if you want to use that kind of language. But the, the central differentiation here is that what slavery did was it, it uh, kept families from forming. And families are the basis of civilization. And so uh, Bob Woodson and I kind of converged on this. It's a deeply Tocquevillian insight, namely 
that if people are going to live well, all these mediating institutions have to be in place. Uh, the conventional family, the conventional church. And what's been very interesting to see, and I think black conservatives and others are starting to see this as a, as a huge problem, is that each time you ratchet farther left, you attack the group that first was the attacker. So feminists, for example, now uh, are under the knife of the transgender group because feminists wanted to use the word women, W-O-M-Y-N, and of course that presumes that there's a binary called male and female. And so they wanna say, no, it's W-O-M-X-N or Z-N or whatever it is. So, so what's happening is the farther left you go, you start attacking the first groups who are liberated. In the case of black America, what's happening is as you move to defend transgenderism, you have to attack the church as being homophobic. You have to attack the family as being, being heteronormative. And I think a lot of blacks and, and women are starting to wake up and say, wait a second here. So what you're saying is that the things I believe and the things that are necessary, especially in the case of blacks to survive and thrive, namely family and church, these things are somehow now anathema. We have to repudiate these things. This is a direct confrontation with Martin Luther King who understood that while the state has to step in a little bit, he was very clear that it was the churches and, and the families that were gonna hold black society together. So the interesting thing is the farther left you go, you end up attacking black Americans. And this is why I've said that identity politics first comes after the white heterosexual male, then it will come after the white woman. And so this is gonna be very interesting to watch how Pelosi fares uh, in, a, in a Democratic Party that is moving more and more into identity politics. She still thinks she can be the broker and has immense skills uh, as, for doing that for, for many, many years. But first, you're going to come for black or for white men. Then you're going to come for white women. And then the next step is going to be black heterosexual men uh, because they're heteronormative. So identity politics ends up eating its own. And that's in a way the good news is that sooner or later, enough people are gonna wake up and say, this is wrong. And I've said to Bob, uh, the, the, the black America thinks that it doesn't have moral authority at the moment. Black America is the only group, if you wanna say there is a group that can do this, it's the only group that has the moral authority to say, we're done. You may not use our wound to continue to move left and then attack the very institutions we need to thrive. They're the only ones with the moral authority. They have more moral authority at this moment in American history than they did in the 1960s during the civil rights movement. They just don't know it. I'm told that, that black churches are not nearly as woke as white churches. They still have a, a deeply theological understanding of, of the task of man in human history. Uh, they're not so much talking about systemic racism uh, they know that sin is a problem perennially that has to be addressed. So the churches are, I think, one hope. But then the question is whether enough Black Americans get activated politically and push back against this Democratic Party that has effectively said, uh, you now have to sit in the back of the bus. You know the reference. You now have to sit in the back of the bus. It was great that you started the bus, but now our task is transgenderism. And uh, this means that anyone who believes that men are men and women are women are guilty of a thought crime and believe that the Bible is also guilty of thought crime. So I think this is the next challenge that uh, identity politics is going to press. And it, it strikes me that that's probably a line that black Americans are not going to be able to accept. So it'll be interesting to see how this works out. You have a, a new book out that's called American Awakening. And uh, it's... Uh... The, the title seems to be kind of a, a double entendre. You're, I mean, th there's actually two awakenings that you're talking about. You're talking about the, the old Protestant awakenings, which were so important in American history. And, yeah. uh, and uh, also, I, I should add, in, in your own Protestantism. And you're talking about the current awakening, which is, uh, on the one hand, it's, it, it's kind of woke, it's kind of Marxist, it's kind of all sorts of things. But in your book, you want to propose that in a lot of ways, it's uh, inheriting the, uh, the traditional American religious awakening and channeling it into other directions. Can you, can, can you tell us about that? So, so to your first part of your question first, or your observations, I, I do think that uh, while cultural Marxism is still an issue and postmodernism is still an issue, my view is that 
conservatives really do need to recognize that this is something new, this identity politics thing. Um, so, and it does accord, it, it does emerge out of American Protestantism. Uh, there have been periodic American awakenings. Uh, and this one is different in that it uses the category of, of purity and stain, which is of course what everybody searching for redemption is concerned about. But it uses them in such a way as, as not to invoke God and not to invoke forgiveness. So we have an American awakening without God and without forgiveness. That, that's what we have this time. And, and my argument is that, that Christianly speaking, uh, the, the resolution to the problem of the sins of the world is the divine scapegoat Christ. And what I'm suggesting is that we, we have a, a, a deeply distorted variant, a perversion of that. What identity politics is trying to do is in fact scapegoat, but to scapegoat a particular mortal group. It's a relationship between the prime transgressor who needs to be scapegoated and various innocent groups. And so you can, you can go online right now and establish what's called your intersectionality score. So you, you assess how many victim categories you have and you can literally establish where you are on the, on the debt and innocence scale. And I think that's what we have with identity politics, this desperate attempt to establish a, a kind of hierarchy of innocence and guilt. And as I say in the book, the, the, the prime transgressor, the white heterosexual male, has to daily go through a Passover ritual. He has to paint the blood of the lamb of innocence on the lintel so that death passes over the household. And that's why you see on office doors around the country, this office is green or or posters of Martin Luther King Day, or whatever woke thing you want to talk about. And last on this point, I, I think the word virtue signaling is actually the wrong word. They're not signaling virtue. Virtue is a Greek uh, good, uh, but innocence is, is biblical. And so I think what they're doing is they're, they're signaling their innocence. So they're white, and so they ought to be guilty. And so but the way in which they can absolve themselves, paint the, the blood of the lamb over their door to keep death from passing over, is to adhere to one of these, these, uh, these, these woke um, uh, programs. And that's, that's woke capitalism, that word. Interesting you should, you should mention Passover because the, you know, the, the, the biblical Passover, uh, the original Passover where you're smearing the, the blood of uh, of the the ram on or, or the sheep on the doorposts is not a sign of innocence. You know, maybe in, in later tradition it it turns into a sign of in, innocence, but in in its original context, the reason Moses has got them all smearing the the sheep's blood on the doorposts is because the sheep was the god of the Egyptians. That that that's what it's that that's what uh -huh. what it says in the Torah. Interesting. And so the the Jews to prove that they deserve to be spared, the Jews have to show that they're willing to slaughter the false god of the Egyptians. And I think that metaphor is actually very relevant to what it is that you're describing because what, what the woke activists demand is exactly this kind of, you wanna be on our side, so let's see what you're willing to kill what you're willing yeah. to destroy or to discredit, what you're willing to, 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 to ruin in order to show that you're, you're a part of us. This is wonderful. So now we can talk for, for a minute about the crisis of Europe because uh, you know, the Europeans feel so guilty about nationalism and about colonialism that, uh, and, there, and there's no Christian way of atoning for their guilt, right? That's been ruled out. And so what they must do, apropos what you just said, is they must smash the thing that they once believed in, which is the nation. And so the, the, the only possible way Europeans can have repentance and have, a, to use my language, to have a tomorrow, uh, the only way they can have a tomorrow is by renouncing the source of the wound, the nation that weighs so heavily on them and embracing the European Union. This is, by the way, I think why in Eastern Europe, where you still have a strong Christian tradition, they don't fall for this false guilt. They say the place where we atone for guilt and find forgiveness is in the church. And, and as a consequence, we're, we're going to continue believing in our nation. And Western Europe, where, the, where that option is not live anymore, the only possible way they can unburden themselves from their perceived stain is by renouncing the nation entirely. That's what the European Union project has become right now. 
Josh, at the National Conservatism Conference last year, you gave a very, very moving talk uh, about what you called the stain of inheritance, which uh, kind of outlined the, the trouble that Americans and, and, and Europeans have with tradition, really with anything that is, that is received from the past. Can you uh, unpack that a little bit for us? What, what is the stain of inheritance? So it, I will say it was prompted by a perhaps caricatured version of conservatism, which holds in, in highest regard inheritance. And one of the things that's interesting about the American debate between right and left, <clears throat> or at least the caricatured version of it, is you have two distinct views, both of which are inadequate. One, the view on the left, according to which America is systemically racist, i.e. stained and irredeemable. And oh, by the way, the political implications of that are more and more state programs. I mean, we have to be clear about this. We can, we can make the historical argument, but really make it or reject it. But it's really about the politics of, of, of a great state, of a bigger state. And on the right, I think in part in part in reaction, the suggestion that no 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 slavery is was was incidental to uh, it America is pure our traditions are good, and my position theologically and this is it's 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 I think it's it's certainly a Christian position but it's definitely a Protestant position, uh, and in fact we could say a Calvinist position, uh, is that our inheritance is mixed. And I'm not troubled by that because I think that the task of moral life is to wrestle with the fact that life is always mixed. And, and I think on the left, you have the view that if there's the slightest bit of stain, then you have to toss the whole thing out. And so uh, Thomas Jefferson, he had slaves. It doesn't matter that he wrote the Declaration of Independence and was one of our greatest statesmen. Uh, even Abraham Lincoln, uh, they'll, they're going after Martin Luther King. They will, they will go after everybody because the world is own, it's partly impure. So there is a, there's a stain in our inheritance. And I, I think the moral dilemma is we have to be able to live with, with the problems of, of, our, of our inheritance. And that means nations too. And in the American case, that means owning up to the fact that there was slavery. Now, Owning up to it, in my view, does not mean collective guilt. It means collective responsibility. So I'm not prepared to say co collective guilt will, will work, nor am I prepared at all to say that reparations is the answer. Because you know, to those who say reparations is the answer, I say two things. Uh, OK, well, how much do I owe? And, and then secondly, um, once I write the check, is the debt cleared? Then my view is it's not because there's something else going on here. There's something deeper than what what money can pay, and that's going to require a lot of goodwill and hard work. And I think we've got to, you know okay, my family came in the 1890s, but I'm still American, and so I'm part of this this great big lovely and messy thing called America. And so I think it's I have some obligation to try to heal wounds where they exist that I that I have been thrust into even though I'm not the maker of them. So I think we have to learn to live in a broken world. And maybe that's too Calvinist, but I think that's the way we defend inheritance because otherwise what happens is you you get the setup which we have now, which is if there's, you wanna say, no, I'm, my inheritance is pure. And then the left says, no, it's systematically stained. And, and I think conservatives run from that. And I think we shouldn't run from it. I think we should say, yeah, slavery happened. Yeah, World War II happened. These things happened. Uh, but but let's figure out how to constructively have it tomorrow. Let's let go of this, work past it. And, uh, and that's the way we move forward, is recognizing the stain that's always there, but it's not the final word. I think you've probably heard this story from me before, that I, I was uh, uh, at an evening a few years ago organized by some of our friends uh, that was supposed to be about uh, political American political theory and there was a, a Protestant and a Catholic and a, and a Jew, and each of them, I, I was the Jew, and each of them was supposed to talk about uh, their religious tradition and its, its relationship to uh, the need for a, a, a revived or re refurbished uh, political thought in, in the United States. And uh, the Catholic spoke first, and 
uh, one of our friends and, and spoke beautifully and at length about what c Catholicism could contribute. And then I did my best on, you know, on what, what Judaism could contribute. And, and then to, I, th I think to our uh, amazement, our, our Protestant colleague opened by saying, well, look, I don't really think that Protestantism has that much to contribute to political theory in America. So we're going to have to leave that to the Catholics and the Jews. And he, he then proceeded to give uh, a, a theological talk, which was you know, very interesting about, uh, uh, about uh, repentance and redemption, but he didn't touch the political at all. And since since that evening, I've actually heard this in 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 you know in, in various contexts with various degrees of seriousness, and uh, it 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 raises questions. I mean, I I, I think among them, um, sure, Catholics and Jews can can contribute important things to to American political thought, but ultimately, it seems to me that uh, that uh, America was a was a creature and a creation of uh, of uh, Protestantism, maybe certain particular kinds of Protestantism. And I, uh, w part of what attracts me to your writing is that it's, it's so overtly Protestant and speaks so directly to the need for, uh, for an intellectual Protestant revival. But is, is, is that something that is possible today? Can, can you, what's your vision for Protestant intellectual revival? I'm haunted by that question. Uh, I, I do go to church, but I generally hold my breath. And, and then when I leave, I, I don't come back for a while. I think it's in a sorry state right now, Protestant theology. Uh, but I think you're, you're quite right in saying that for better or for worse, America is constituted by a series of, let's call them Protestant categories, which are not going to go away. And my argument is that what actually happened uh, was that it was the collapse of the mainline churches which led to identity politics. And by that, I mean that, uh, that at least during the first part of the 20th century, and liberal Protestantism, Protestantism made a mess of things, but at least until the first part of the 20th century, there was an understanding that sin and transgression mattered, that atonement mattered, um, that forgiveness mattered. And there was a rich theological language through which this was worked out. And... Reinhold Niebuhr, who, is, who I'm a great fan of, uh, made it his life's work to try to save this idea of sin, original sin, in Protestant churches and said on a couple of occasions, I have failed. And I've been trying to write a book on Niebuhr for a long time, and I realized I couldn't. And the reason why I couldn't was because sin as a theological category has little purchase now. But what happened was that sin didn't disappear. Sin migrated into the Democratic Party. And, and the migration of this idea of sin and transgression is identity politics. And so the Pew Charitable Trust has come out with numerous polls, some very prominent, one in particular, which indicates that Americans are increasingly nuns. They have no affiliation. And my argument is you're looking at the wrong question. You're not posing the right question. Americans don't need to go to church now. The Protestants don't need to go to church now to find find an economy of salvation, stain, and sin. They go to identity politics. Identity politics is the new Protestantism. It's a deeply, deeply contorted one. And and my view is that we should at least, this is going to sound strange, but, but you're on, we should at least be thankful because the alternative, as I point out in the book, is Nietzsche. And, and Nietzsche is very clear about the, traject the trajectory of Europe, the trajectory of the West, and where he wants it to go. And his argument was that, uh, it's in the genealogy of morals, that once there were Christian categories and Christian religion and Christian morality were the same thing, and he's projecting a time coming up, he's writing the 1870s, 1880s, when um, when you'd have this strange hybrid where the Christian ideas would be there, but not the Christian religion. And that's, I think, what identity politics is, is we have all these Christian categories, the innocent one, uh, transgression and, and stain, as I've said, but without the Christian architecture. And what Nietzsche wanted to do, we should be very clear, what Nietzsche wanted to do was to get past that entirely. And he raises in the second essay, The Genealogy, the following question, on what grounds can we have a tomorrow? And he says, for the Christian, you have it tomorrow 
when the weight of guilt is lifted from your shoulders through forgiveness. So you have tomorrow through forgiveness. And his answer was, we have a tomorrow through forgetfulness. In other words, we don't care. And I think that's what the alt-right is doing. It's saying the Holocaust, we don't care. Colonialism, we don't care. Slavery, we don't care. I am frightened to death, and here my Protestantism really does come through. I'm frightened to death that the younger generation, especially boys, are, are developing what could be called racial fatigue. They just say, I've heard the story. I, I don't care anymore. And I see this in Europe as well. So, so the good news, I think, is that at least the categories of transgression and stain are still being used. They're used in, in deeply perverse, perverse ways, but the alternative would be far worse. Namely, we go to a Nietzschean world where we forget the transgressions, uh, where the only two categories are strength and weakness. And so in that sense, Yoram, I'm actually hopeful because at least we're still holding on to the categories of transgression and innocence. And my hope, frankly, is that is that the left begins to awaken to the idea, to the understanding that these things can't be worked through. You can't get to a just world by thinking through transgression and stain imminently, because once you purge the group of white men, then you're going to have to purge the right white women and then the black heterosexual, and it just keeps going on and on, and you still go to bed and you feel guilty at night. So, uh, so I'm, yes, of course, I'm frightened by this identity politics thing. I think it will do ghastly damage before it's done, but at least it's still using the biblical categories of stain and transgression. I, I think some of our Catholic friends, if I might pose a question that that they would ask, their argument is, uh, and and this is in you know in, in response to you know some of my work and 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 writings trying to point to uh, pro Protestant political theory foundations uh, in in the Anglo American traditions trad tradition, and uh, I, I think some of our our close Catholic friends and and uh, compatriots, uh, what what they would challenge you with is they would say, look the the idea of uh, Christian categories migrating away from an actual from from an actual Christian tradition is not something new. It's actually something that's born uh, with the Reformation. And and you know when when they criticize liberalism, their, their their criticism sounds almost exactly like yours. What they're saying is, what is liberalism other than the migration of certain real Christian categories into a framework that that no longer recognizes uh, uh, no longer recognizes God or scripture. And uh, so if they pose that challenge to you, I mean, in, in effect, to, to, to put it simply, really what they're saying is only a, a tradition can anchor those theological ca categories. And they'll say, well, Catholicism has a tradition. It's good at tradition. But what the Protestants did was they overthrew the tradition, and now they're reaping what it is that they originally sowed. Now, how do you answer that? Uh, so Patrick, you know, our, both of our dear friends, Patrick Deneen, I think is probably one of the strongest voices uh, in this regard. Um, so part of my answer is, it's, it's, not, it's not a philosophically adequate answer, but it's a path dependency answer. And by which I mean, like it or not, the American tradition was constituted by this tradition of, of Protestantism. And, and I, of course, want to push back against the liberal individualist claim because Calvin was hardly that. Uh, there's a big grand covenantal tradition, which then becomes through Lincoln, a, a national covenantal tradition. And that might be a, all sorts of problems associated with it, and that's probably right. But, but my argument here is that we're st whether we like it or not, we're working within, these, uh, within a larger Protestant framework in America. And I think this is part of the reason why, for example, arguments about natural law, which are set forth all the time, um, fall on deaf ears uh, in the left because the left isn't thinking in terms of natural law. They're thinking in terms of, of purity and stain. And my argument is America can't solve her problem except by working within the extant categories that America has always had. And so this is, I, you know, I, in the book, I move back and forth and I, I'm quite aware of the difficulties. I, I sometimes say that, uh, that we are an American awakening, which is using Christian categories. And, and that's true, but I think it's really a hardened 
Christian view, which is to say a view of the darkness of man. The white heterosexual man is guilty of original sin. And as we know, at least according to identity politics, and as we know, this is one of the great divides between Roman Catholicism and Protestantism. How deep does sin go? Well, look at identity politics. Their claim is that original sin is absolutely irredeemable. Now, theologically, that's correct. But what they want to do is attribute it to a particular mortal group, right? Which is why you have to purge the white male heterosexual. So, you know, I, I, I have deep uh, appreciation for what the, what the Roman Catholics have done. It. I mean, I want to speak generally, but I'm going to have to here. They have constantly reminded America that tradition and inheritance matter. And it's not by accident that there are so many Roman Catholics in the national conservatism movement. And my caution to come back to my talk was, okay, let us admit the importance of inheritance, but it can't be without an understanding that there's still some brokenness attentive, attend, attending it. And so, uh, and that was my sort of Calvinist remark about uh, the, the stain of our inheritance. So look, we're gonna all be working together I think we all agree that identity politics is deeply pernicious. My argument is it's going to be very difficult to, to address the problem without staying within the Protestant categories. Whatever your final philosophical judgment might be about it, I simply don't think you're going to be able to uh, diffuse the problem by invoking natural law. Well, we've had a really good example uh, in just, just in, in the last uh, few months of a uh, a really interesting theologically inspired uh, political development, which was the uh, the the development and the signing of the Abraham Accords, uh, where uh, you know for those of us in uh, in in Israel, we, it does feel kind of like we're 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 seeing a a miracle over the course of a few months. Uh, suddenly, peace agreements between the state of Israel and uh, th uh, up until up until now, three three different Arab countries, uh, which had had no relations with us, have have, have been signed. Uh, this is in part under the, you know, under the uh, the aegis of the Trump administration. I would say, in large part, the willingness to uh, to look at the Middle East from a completely different angle than you know any previous American administration, and and it it hit the jackpot. Uh, but if uh, if you allow me to to suspend the the usual cynicism for for just a moment, um, the the Abraham Accords the the name is a is a religious name, and it is intended to invoke the commonality that uh, that uh, the Arab signatories believe that they have with uh, with uh, with the Jewish state with the state of state of Israel, all, all of us being Abraham's children. And uh, this is something that uh, I, I can't tell you how how much enthusiasm and excitement there there is for this in Israel. It's kind of, it's a little bit unfortunate that Americans are so um, so deep within their civil crisis that it's difficult for people on any side to understand you know the the uh, the tectonic shift, the earthquake in uh, in what's taken place here. Uh, we, we in Israel we're, we're we're sitting and and watching as day after day, um, uh, ad additional ties are forged, uh, business ties, travel ties, communication ties between uh, us and uh, the Emirates, and which which is just you know we all hope God, God willing is the beginning of uh, of really a new leaf between uh, the Jews and the and and uh, and the Gulf states, um, but this is a uh, ultimately, something that uh, is bearing fruit because of because of theological foundations. Now, you uh, have spent quite a few years in the Middle East. Uh, you 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 were there during during the uh, the the lengthy American engagement in Iraq. You you set up a, a college uh, to help train Iraqis, and uh, so th this this whole part of your life was. You could say it was part of it was kind of a neoconservative part of your life. I don't know if, if you you believed in those things, but the 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 way that this was taking place was that you know the the old lib, in, liberal internationalism and neoconservatism said w we got to get to places like Iraq and Afghanistan 
overthrow the you know the bad traditions, impose a uh, a, a a rational liberal modern outlook, which which many people in America and and believed could you know you could just explain it to them, and and would work. You spent years there trying to implement this. Can you tell us how, how did it go? Did you did you learn anything from it? Uh, and 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 what should we learn from your experiences there? So I'll give you the full story. So I was actually born in Cairo. My father was really the first to write a book about this group nobody had heard of called the Muslim Brotherhood. And his, his book is still the definitive work. And then we were State Department. And I My formative years were spent in, in Yemen and Kuwait. And I spent probably the slightly more than half of the last 15 years in the Middle East wrestling with this question about where does the Middle East go? Um, I should say my support for uh, support for the war was was on slightly different grounds, the Iraqi war. Uh, in 1961, when I was six years old, my father sat my sister and me down at the breakfast table and there in Kuwait, Kuwait City, and, and pointed northward to Iraq and said, never forget that Iraq has the most vibrant political culture and artistic culture in the Middle East. Never forget that. And I didn't forget that. And, and, and yet the Ba'athists came and poured acid on this rich, robust culture. And so my support for the war was, was slightly more tempered. My hope was that what might happen was that if Saddam would, could be deposed, this rich, vibrant Iraqi culture could reassert itself. I continue to believe that it will, but I believe it will be a 50 year project. Uh, I met remarkable uh, octogenarians uh, in when I was in Kurdistan who would tell me stories of how they went to the United States in the 1950s on, on college foreign exchange programs and they were they were better prepared college students than our Americans were so when nations have reservoirs of talent it, it doesn't go away it comes back it takes a while so I, I'm I'm hopeful that Iraq will will finally um, make its way I'm not convinced that democracy is a universal political form. In that sense, I'm not a conservative, a neoconservative rather. Um, my Qatari students, and I was on the startup team there in 2005, Georgetown startup team in Doha, Qatar for the School of Foreign Service. Um, they have said to me repeatedly, why do, you George, why do your Georgetown students come over and give us lectures about how democracy is a universal political form. We know that constitutional monarchy is the universal political form and, and we're gonna stick with it. And I'm perfectly content to live in such a world. So then the question would be, so why do I go to the Middle East and teach Western education? And the answer to that question is that I think Tocqueville is actually right, that, that something is happening in the world and we can describe it in a number of ways and we call it modernity, but Tocqueville's account of this is that the links that tie people together in the aristocratic age are slowly breaking everywhere. And his question was, how were we gonna to respond to it? And he thought Europe was gonna have a heck of a time uh, because they had these memories of the aristocratic past. And he thought the Americans didn't have these aristocratic memories. It's that America did not have an aristocratic past. So, but the Middle East does have an aristocratic past. And yet it's also true that the links are being broken. And what I, I have found that my students, especially in the Gulf, where you don't have modernity, you've got hypermodernity, where nothing really seems to fit together. And, and what they do is they oscillate back and forth between a kind of anomic, individualistic, sometimes narcissistic frame of mind where they feel utterly unlinked and, and fully capable of dreaming of very nihilistic dreams. Um, and on the other hand, because they haven't found a way to build a world together through voluntary associations, et cetera, they dream of an enchanted past. And this is, I think, exactly what Tocqueville understood, that, that when you move into this modern dealing condition, one of the temptations will be to re-enchant the world. And my view is that we're, we're incorrect in calling it Islamic fundamentalism. It doesn't get it what's going on. What's going on is an attempt to re-enchant the world. So it's precisely in conditions of hypermodernity where you've got all these opulent individuals like uh, Osama bin Laden and his family, which are very well off, 
that you produce this longing for an enchanted past. And so Tocqueville is, in my view, very, uh, very apropos in, in the Middle East. He sees the breakdown, or he would have seen the breakdown. And so uh, the reason why I go, this is a long answer to your question, but the reason why I go back, and will probably continue to go back, is because the cat's out of the bag. These kids are already feeling isolated and on their own. And I think what liberal education can do is to perhaps give them the tools, the resources. What I mean by that is give them authors who have thought through this thing very carefully and pointed a constructive way out. Because if they don't find a constructive way out, my claim is that the Middle East will continue to oscillate back and forth between hypermodernity and reenchantment movements. And this will go on for hundreds of years. Wow, that, 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 that's a pretty scary vision. Yeah. So, so w what is it that we should be doing if we don't want to see that kind of oscillation back and forth? Well, I will say, you know, the Iraqis were very mixed in their assessments of America. As you well know, the, the Kurds loved us in part because we provided the no fly zone. But they, they both love us and hate us uh, deeply. And I've come away thinking that you know, military engagement is a, you, you really better be prepared to go all the way. The idea that the purpose of a military engagement is to bring democracy or to, to be a police action, no, no, no. If you're involved in a military engagement, it is for the purpose of, of eliminating a certain existential possibility. Here I'm strangely Hobbesian. You know, I, I think that if you're really going to transform, then you really have to go in and break up the institutions. And I don't think we have the stomach for it, and I don't think we should. So I think the one thing that that Middle Eastern countries and students love about America is American higher education. And so I think we should do everything we possibly can to offer higher education. Now, I will say as a caveat, I'm quite concerned because oftentimes the teachers who go over there hate America and they're the worst possible emissaries you can have. They're hard left. Uh, but still, I think if you can get students to develop what I call authorial voice, to begin to think um, out, outside of the box that have been established for them by their K through 12 teachers, get them to be able to uh, you know, think critically. I mean, I'm, I think you can go too far with this, but you know, Yoram, when I when we got there in Iraq and we gave them the assignment of Plato's Apology and we said, tell us what you think about this tomorrow in class after you read it, they looked at us with incredulity and they said, no teacher has ever asked us what we think. They've simply asked us to memorize what they say verbatim and repeat it back to them. What strikes me that we can provide a service by providing the, a new venue, a new new model for higher education in the Middle East. So I think that's what we should be doing most of all. Well, you, you brought up the uh, the question that I was going to ask you. You're a professor at, at Georgetown and um, you've been watching the uh, development of American academia in a particular direction for a long time. and. You know, I, I, I do have this question. Uh, as you know, I was also in, involved in an experiment of est uh, establishing a liberal arts college in, uh, in, in Jerusalem. And uh, I've, I have become a little bit more skeptical about it because only because it seems that as the years go on, uh, it becomes more and more difficult to point to academic institutions that are... Uh, teaching philosophy, political theory, religion, uh, and, and, and other his history and other humanistic disciplines, literature, in a way that's uh, r remotely like this idea, uh, I, I, idea of what, what you're calling liberal education. Yeah. Um, I, I, I have various kids in college now, uh, and Israel's not quite as bad as America's become, but, but it's pretty bad. And, and so I, I wonder whether it's not the case that basically any kind of initiative at this point um, is 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 going to be uh, exporting a, a very pernicious kind of a uh, worldview to societies that that really just don't don't need that. Right? That it would be inflaming hatred hatred of America more than anything else. So I. I, I 
was at, 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 a, at a conference with uh, Roger Scruton in the last year of his life. And, and he, um, and, and he uh, astonished everybody by saying that the tum, time had come for uh, considering uh, defunding the universities. Or, or or closing them. I mean, th these were his his words. People were just uh, yeah. amazed. So he, he made an exception. He said, you know, except for engineering and the sciences. But this this view that academia is so far gone that it it cannot it, it cannot be saved. It's beginning to circulate. Very important yeah. for 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 our audience to know what is it, what do you think about this. Well, I'm reluctantly coming to the conclusion that Roger had come to, uh, but but I want to say something else about this. Um, we should never forget that even under the most tyrannical circumstances, there are minor miracles that can happen. Uh, I, I was told when I started out in graduate school that political theory was a dead discipline. And, and while it is true, there are only two or three places in the country where I would send my undergraduates these days there's still room for minor miracles. So I, I, it's not a completely closed system yet, uh, but the problem has been the growth of the, of, of the administration in the university. I mean, yes, professors, they have all their problems and they, between postmodernism and, and Marxism, you've made a mess of the humanities, but frankly, you're on, at this point, the bigger problem are the mental health facilities and student affairs uh, and, and the Dean suites where now it is acceptable and, and pretty much understood that deans will sign their emails with the proper pronoun. What is the pronouns that I'm using? I mean, they're, they're embracing this transgender stuff. Uh, nobody asked us. And it's only gonna be a question of time before I get called on, on the, you know, talking about just men and women uh, in history of political thought. Uh, so sooner or later, the administration is going to back up the students and it's going to attack the students or attack the professors. So I had hoped, frankly, that Betsy DeVos had had a little more courage and and said some things that Trump began to say, which is, listen, you can't get public funding and be the intellectual arm of the Democratic Party. That's not how this works. And it's going to require some time, I think, uh, but at some point that's what's going to have to happen. I will say, in terms of my own graduate students, the most interesting ones now are, are ones who recognize that they're probably not going to get a tenure track position, but they're moving into magazines, they're moving uh, into foundation work. So what's going to have to happen is they're going to have to have a university outside of a university. I don't know for how long. But the great news is there's really, really thoughtful people out there, some of whom have PhDs in political theory and some don't, who, who don't have to endure the ordeal daily of dealing with their universities. Looking back over four years of, uh, of uh, the Trump administration, uh, at the other side of, uh, uh, of the, that ad adventure of an administration, what do you think we've um, we've gained from the Trump presidency, and what have we lost? It's been very important because I think what it allowed conservatives to do, beginning with that Glen Cove conference in December after he was elected, remember this? I the, I, I remember I remember your brilliant speech in December 2016. It was it was remarkable. Well, I think all of us. It was so remarkable to me was that. All of us said some variant of this, and there were what, 50, 60, 70 people there. Right. We said some variant of this. Yeah, I, I voted for Reagan and I was willing to support free markets, but I, I wasn't really convinced that market efficiency is the sole criteria on the basis of which we establish social policy. And we also said, all of us said something like this. Well, you know, yeah, I, I kind of supported Bush, but I really wasn't comfortable with spending blood and treasure abroad for this abstract principle called democracy. However committed we were probably all to it in our own countries. So I think what the Trump administration did was that it, it took apart two, two pillars of the Republican Party, Reaganism and Bush Twoism, and it also destroyed the Clinton dynasty. 
that alone would, would have, those things alone were utterly unpredicted. Nobody believed that Trump could do that. We went into 2016 election thinking that it was a battle between one family dynasty and another. And we came out with this man from Queens. And I have viewed this as, as an opportunity for conservatives to coalesce around a new, more humbled set of ideas around the nation, which is why I think the movement you're running is the most important intellectual development on the conservative front, full stop. Uh, and it's also given us a, a courage to, to start opposing identity politics, to start saying, okay, I might be a, well, I'm a Phoenician, but I might be a white heterosexual male, but, uh, but it, it doesn't matter. I still have the right to speak. And I think Trump gave a certain, his bombast gave us courage, and now we're going to have to have courage even if he doesn't, and it doesn't look like he will, but I think it's emboldened a younger generation of conservatives to say, we took a, a, a course, and now we have to change course, and we have to think about our nation, and we have to think about the middle class, and we have to think about people having, and I say this in the book, we have to develop a, a, a politics of competence, not a politics of innocence, a politics of competence. And that means building a world together with our neighbors in our local communities and at the national level as well. But we've made a terrible wrong turn in thinking that the only thing we need to measure in politics is what your innocence category is and give resources based on what your innocence category is. You cannot build a world that way. So Trump, I think, has prepared the ground for that. And I'm, it's going to be very curious to see what 2024 brings in the Republican Party. My own view is you're going to have the reemergence of a couple of neoconservative characters. Uh, uh, figures. Uh, I think Rubio and Nikki Haley are going to be interesting on that side. And I think um, uh, there'll be a few others who still want to, Josh Hawley probably will, will probably want to take on the Trump mantle, but, but we'll see. Josh Mitchell, it was great to have you on NatCon Talk. Thank you for having me around. It's good to see you. Thank you for joining us for another episode of NatCon Talk. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit that notification button so you don't miss us next time.